This research was first presented by Steve Clark uh, last year at uh, the Optimizes 2016 conference. And it's the result of the collaboration between Steve, who's the international chairman of the C-Class catamarans, uh, Ian uh, here of Red Cedar, and uh, myself of Flexus. And the work was conducted with the goal of leveraging HEED's uh, design exploration then uh, in the application of a new technology to the rigid sails of the uh, C-Class catamarans. Uh, so we're going to talk briefly on the background of what C-Class sailing is all about, uh, a bit about the technology that Flexus has developed, and then go through the design exploration work that was conducted uh, for this application and wrap up with the findings and uh, a summary of possible future work. The class is 45 years old. It started in the early 60s to be a test bed for the modernization of the sailing catamaran. The C-class catamaran is 25 feet long. It's 14 feet wide with 300 square feet of sail area and a crew of two. And this, is about, and this about sums up the only rules. They're used for competition, which means sailing a series of races over a period of a week at a time. Uh, you have to be able to sail upwind and downwind multiple times a day and in all directions and conditions. So the competition requires building practical designs that not only perform, perform well, but are lightweight and robust to meet the demanding conditions. As you can see, they have rigid wing sails, and when the America's Cup recast itself several years ago, they pretty much took these boats and scaled them up. Uh, there are things about them that are unusual. Uh, as you can see, they sail on hydrofoils and are quite fast. And this is Groupama, the current champion. This is a polar diagram that represents how fast the boats can typically go. The wind direction is going from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Uh, this shows the highest speeds you can go in the various directions relative to the true angle of the wind. So away from the wind, you can go 25 knots and over 15 knots upwind, which is essentially 20 to 30 miles per hour. One of the things unique to sailing is that there is no stored energy devices. Any energy is extracted from the atmosphere to, remove over, to move over the water. Um, if you think of the sail as an aircraft wing on its side, we use the lift generated by the wing to propel the boat. The boats um, operate at the intersection of two boundary layers. The wind over the surface of the earth is one boundary layer, and the wind speed varies with height, which is interesting. Um, on the left is a typical atmospheric boundary layer showing the variation in wind with height. It shows that the wind at 10 meters can be twice the velocity uh, than at water level. This has implications for the design in the wind uh, in that the wind blows harder aloft and can actually be from a different direction. And the second boundary layer is the water. Uh, the water blows, uh, the wind blows over the water and it wrinkles the surface and causes it to create waves. When operating a hydrofoil in this environment, you, you need some way of keeping it below the surface of the water. As soon as the hydrofoil lifts up out of the water, it is no longer creating any lift and the boat will crash. So these are the main factors of operating in this boundary layer intersection. Now the C-Class sail rig is really quite clever in its design. Uh, it's a three element sail with the third element being what we refer to as the flap. The second element is a small section that pivots in such a way to create uh, asymmetry there and maintain a constant amount of gap between 13 degrees and the full flap angle of 36 degrees. So this, this gap improves the attached flow at these higher camber angles. 
the apparent wind is the direction of the air flowing over the boat and sail. Uh, so it's a combination of the true wind speed and the direction along which the boat uh, uh, and, and the direction along uh, with the boat speed and direction. So uh, think, think of riding a bicycle. When you are stationary, you're, you, you feel the wind from a specific direction, but as you move faster and faster, the wind direction moves around toward the front until it feels like you're riding directly into the wind. Taking into account the wind gradient near the surface means that the top of the sail uh, uh, has a greater angle of attack, which means, uh, which then needs to be compensated for uh, by having active twist control in the wingspan. So uh, uh, they already have quite a clever and uh, unique uh, rigid sail design and capability. So the general difference between an aircraft wing that we're all familiar with and the sail on a boat is that on an aircraft there's only one way that is up. However, on a sailboat, two ways are up, port and starboard. Uh, accounting for this requires symmetry in the sail design. Also, airspeed is relatively constant along the span of an aircraft wing compared to a sail where you have airspeed and angle of attack varying along the span. Uh, so the sailboat requires a broader performance envelope to be considered. But on the bright side, the sailboat does have softer landings. So Flexus is an engineering design firm located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we specialize in compliant mechanism design. Uh, Flexus is best known for inventing the morphing aircraft wing that has been extensively tested by the Air Force and NASA and is now expected to be seen on commercial aircraft by 2020. Uh, the development was driven by an expected 5 to 12 percent fuel burn savings uh, with its smooth surface transition that you can see here um, and uh, actively adapting to flight conditions um, such uh, like reducing lift and drag as the drag as the aircraft becomes lighter from burning fuel be a good example. Um, this ability to be strong yet flexible and provide smooth contours is appealing to this C-Class application. The uh, C-Class enables innovation uh, by having few rules, as I had mentioned earlier, and uh, it makes it uh, an ideal test bed. Flexus uh, believes that the technology can be simplified from what is required of aircraft, though, and not be overly complex. But what we don't know is if the bang would be worth the buck, so to speak. That is uh, really what we're, we're hoping to find out with this preliminary joint investigation. So the objective of this research was to investigate how morphing the flap or mainsail would affect performance. Three new design concepts were compared to the standard three rigid uh, element sail. A three element sail with a flexible flap, a two element sail with a flexible mainsail and rigid flap, and a two element sail with a flexible main, mainsail and standard flap. The investigation was restricted to 2D profiles uh, to make the investigation practical from the time aspect. So 3D effects such as cross flow and more advanced turbulence models were not taken into consideration here. Performance was determined by comparing the designs at different apparent wind angles for different, uh, the different wind angles for the different flap rotations and flexure angles. The objectives were to maximize lift and minimize drag, of course, and maximum lift is defined as the maximum lift achieved before significant flow separation occurs. Design exploration with heads was used for two uh, key reasons. The first is the nonlinear behavior of the sail performance. Uh, Flow separation occurs in different parameters and combinations that are not always intuitive. The second is that testing, uh, the testing process could be automated to search for improved geometry configurations. So as the table shows, the number of possible solutions comes quite large once the parameters 
uh, varied go uh, beyond one. Uh, this becomes even larger when you test for three different apparent wind directions. Uh, heats can effectively search then the design space in fewer evaluations to make finding the best solutions time efficient. The design exploration workflow consisted of making changes to the sailed geometry in SOLIDWORKS, passing the updated geometry then to STAR CCM CFD, remeshing and solving the flow model, and then having HEADS review the results uh, to determine the next design config configuration to try. In this plot, we see the variation of the coefficient of lift with drag for different flap angles of the rigid sail. Uh, the color and size of the dots represent the flap angle. The images show the velocity over the sail cross-section there as the flap angle increases. Uh, you'll notice that, the, that uh, at the high flap angle, there's a stream of clean air passing by the trailing edge of the mainsail. Um, and it's uh, uh, remaining attached to the flap, re-energizing the flow and then generating higher lift than uh, if the gap was not there. So that, was, that is the purpose of the, uh, of the gap and controlling the gap, the size of the gap. By allowing the flap to morph, the maximum lift coefficient is higher, but we now see several configurations where there's significant turbulence being generated from the trailing edge of the flap. The color of the dots represent the flap angle. The size of the dot there represents the flap flex angle. Uh, so uh, all of the high lift solutions occur at or near the maximum flap angle, but not the maximum flap flex angle, if that makes sense. Also note that in some instances, the flap flexes in the opposite direction to the rigid rotation there uh, in an effort to prevent separation and reduce drag. And this was pretty counterintuitive and a, uh, kind of a surprise for us to see. Uh, for the morphing mainsail, the lift coefficient curve is very different. It seems to indicate uh, that as angle increases, the drag reduces. However, what drives this behavior is the gap between the flap and the mainsail and the flex direction of the mainsail relative to the apparent wind angle. At very low flap angles, air does not pass through the gap and has a different performance characteristic. As the mainsail morphs, we are effectively getting very different airfoils that are no longer symmetric. And so the graph is a hybrid of different flap angles and different airfoils. The color of the dots represent the flap angle. The size of the dot represents the sail flex angle. It is clear that the highest lift designs have far lower flap angles, but the sail flex is at or near the maximum. One point to keep in mind is that the gap size was not optimized for this sail. It was based on the original sail design, which has a flap element that keeps the gap size constant. Um, that was not factored into the geometry of uh, this sail, which means that the gap size also varies depending on the flap angle and sail flex. It becomes more challenging to interpret the performance graph when we have both the mainsail and the flap flexing. The reason is we are comparing many different airfoil and flap config configurations on one chart. The color of the dots here represent the flap angle and the size of the dot represents the sail flex angle. So again, the highest lift designs have far lower flap angles. The amount of flex is still at or near the maximum. What about transient effects? Uh, what happens if we take that into account for the highest lift configurations of each concept? For the existing design, the rigid flap and sail, uh, the flow remains attached and is steady.
So the performance from our static flow analysis is very close. Uh, the max drag is computed for the transient analysis is a little uh, higher, though. For the morphing flap design, we are seeing vortex shedding occurring, which leads to an oscillating response. The variation in lift is much larger than the drag variation, but the transient results indicate a lower max lift coefficient, but also a significantly lower drag coefficient. Similar to the original design, the morphing mainsail configuration has a steady state solution. For the morphing flap and sail, the transient results are quite different. Uh, the lift is significantly lower and the drag far higher. So if we summarize the transient results, taking the lowest lift values, uh, one key characteristic becomes clear. Uh, the morphing, uh, morphing the sails and flap provides a significant performance increase for the generated lift at a zero degree angle of attack. Uh, the effect on the computed drag varies. However, overall there is a reduction in uh, drag leading to better lift and lift on drag performance. So why does morphing work? We alluded to it earlier that it is providing us with a non-symmetrical sail configuration. So let's compare the performance of the standard sail for a wind angle of five degrees. The yellow dots are for the standard sail, the blue dots are for the morphing flap design. So for the standard sail, the max the max lift over drag occurs near 32 to 33 and a half degree flap rotation. Comparing this to the morphing flap design, the max lift over drag is near a 26 degree flap rotation, but with almost 10 degrees of flap morphing. This is like having an equivalent flap rotation of 36 degrees, but with far less drag and higher lift. Comparing the best performing profiles of each concept clearly shows the added effective curvature uh, provided by morphing the flap, the sail, or both. Uh, keep in mind, this is for continu uh, conditions where flow can still remain attached to the higher curvature configurations. From the research work conducted, we identified three key points. Uh, morphing the sail is more effective at lower angles of attack. This is because the effective increase in camber generates higher lift, and this is very attractive for improving the upwind pointing on a sailboat. The morphing provides increased efficiency by delivering more lift for the same drag or less drag for the same lift. The preference for higher lift or lower drag depends on the tacking angle of the boat relative to the wind. And we showed the importance of transient results in determining performance when vortices are present. Uh, static analysis overpredicts the performance. So while this initial investigation was successful in showing uh, that there's value in morphing sail geometry, uh, there's additional work that needs to be done to further quantify the performance gains. Um, one interesting aspect is the reversed camber that was seen for certain configurations. Uh, work needs to be done to see if the sail control system can provide this flexibility or if only progressive flexing can be incorporated. An aspect not accounted for in the morphing mainsail model was maintaining that constant slot gap at all flap angles. So this needs to be evaluated not only from an efficiency aspect but also from an articulation control perspective. The adjustment of the sail uh, evaluated was just for pure flexing. Um, so what, uh, what if that 
is uh, something we considered is what if that is expanded to include changing the section profile and using HEADS to determine the optimal profile for the different conditions instead of just taking what is uh, uh, existing and morphing it. And finally, a trade-off study needs to be done to determine if the aerodynamic uh, benefits are worth the complexity and possible weight increase from the morphing mechanicals when we come up with them. So the technology shows great potential, but it needs to deliver a robust design that can withstand the harsh conditions. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank you for viewing the presentation, and I hope that you can appreciate the challenges faced in uh, competing in C-Class sailing now, along with potential applications of this uh, uh, morphing technology from uh, Flexus.